Thank you uh, immensely. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I want to say I've never had an audience quite this large before, so Fortaleza, you do me proud. I have spent uh, much of my life uh, working on uh, questions of uh, social justice uh, and urbanization. And uh, for me, uh, I have a deep uh, passion and concern uh, for trying to think about a more socially just form of the city. In, uh, Pursuing uh, that aim, uh, I switched positions uh, so that I increasingly tried to bring together my studies of urbanization and my studies of uh, Marx's theory. Uh, I didn't uh, take up Marxism for very political reasons, in fact, uh, I was 35 years old before I ever read Marx, but when I started to read it, it became clear to me uh, that this is a very insightful way of describing the nature of the problem that we face. Now, Marx is not that easy to read, which is why I produced the two companions to Marx's Capital in the hope that uh, more people would be able to read it and understand uh, some of the really good ideas uh, that you can get from it. I also found as an academic person that I really could not understand what was going on in cities without establishing a relationship with social movements, uh, homeless organizations, the right to the city organizations, and so I have been an active supporter and an active participant in some of the work on the right to the city. Uh, and to be honest, uh, most of the good ideas I've ever had about urbanization come from the social movements, from the kind of people who spoke here just now. But I felt it was my task to try to put together some of the wisdom that was coming from the social movements with some theoretical understanding of why some of these things are happening. Why is it that right now property capital and capital in general is expelling so many people in so many cities around the world from viable and valuable locations? In fact, uh, I've heard the sorts of stories we heard here tonight in Istanbul, I've heard it in uh, many other cities in Mumbai, in India, I've heard it uh, in China, uh, I've heard it uh, in London, I've heard it in almost every major city I've ever visited. So why is this happening around the world and what is it that we can do to stop it? And this is where Marx, I think, helps. Because what Marx does is to describe the general nature of capital and in so doing to point out some of the contradictions within capital that lead it to certain strategies of development. For instance, one of the things we know about capital is that it must grow in order to survive. It must increase value, it must expand uh, its range and its reach. So we live in a society that is committed to endless growth. Uh, and if you say, well, how much growth, the general argument would be uh, we should be growing at least at the rate of 3% per year. And if we look back historically, we will see that since 1800, capital has been growing at the rate of 2.25% per year, slightly less than the decent rate of growth, which is 
Now, capital has to grow for one very simple reason, that capital has to work on the idea that there is profit at the end of the day. And if there is going to be profit, there has to be more at the end of the day. The classic way in which Marx described this was that the capitalist starts the day with a certain amount of money, goes into the market and buys labor power and means of production, puts the labor power and means of production to work to create a new commodity, then sells that commodity at the end of the day for the original amount of money plus the profit, i.e. what Marx called the surplus value, which means that there must be more at the end of the day than there was at the beginning of the day. So capitalism has to expand, it has to grow. And then the big question is, where does it grow? When Marx was writing, it mainly grew because the world was pretty empty. It could go to North America, build a new capitalism in North America. It could go to Argentina, it could go to Australia. It could conquer India and use that as its market. It could bring China in and make it the market. So when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848, he described a situation in which he said, capital is destined to create the world market. It has to make the whole world its market eventually. But in 1848, there was plenty of room to expand. There continued to be plenty of room to expand in 1900. And there were difficulties after that with the two world wars, but during the 1950s and 1960s, capital could still continue to expand across the earth. In 1970, it faced a, a difficult problem. Where was it going to expand? But it had a piece of good luck. The Soviet empire collapsed, so that was integrated into capitalism, and China was integrated into capitalism. But now we have the problem of China is already part of the capitalist dynamic, a very central part. Uh, Eastern Europe is in, Ch and Russia is in. Uh, where can we expand now? Well, there's some places in Africa and some other places, but by and large, the, the ability to expand is now facing a crisis. And the crisis is made very significant because the rate of growth that we have is what we call exponential or compound rate of growth. Now it's important to understand the character of compound growth. Uh, the classic story which we tell on this is that the person who invented the game of chess was offered a reward and the king who, or whoever it was offered the reward said tell me what reward you want. And the person who invented it said put one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard, put two grains on the second, and then double it across all of the squares. So you get a sequence, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, and what you see here is a gradual curve that gets faster and faster moving upwards until after a while it goes like this. Então, você tem uma sequência de números que vai de 1, 2 e assim sucessivamente até 128. E você percebe como essa curva esse, é, tem um crescimento bastante acelerado até que ela se torna praticamente reta. E nesse chess reward scheme, by the time you got to the 30 second square, you had used up all the rice in the world, which then posed you a problem of how do you get from the 32nd square to the 64th square when there's no rice left. Essa questão da recompensa do xadrez coloca o seguinte problema. Quando você chega no 32º quadrado, você já utilizou todo o arroz que havia no mundo. Então, como é que você sai do 32º para o quadrado número 64, sendo que todo o arroz já acabou? The only way you can do it is in fact by pledging next year's rice harvest. <laughs> 
but then you have to pledge the year after two years rice harvest, then four years rice harvest, and by the time you get to the 64th square, you've actually got close to uh, pledging the rice harvest into infinity. Você teria que agir da seguinte forma, dar como garantia a sua colheita futura de arroz, dos dois anos seguintes, dos quatro anos seguintes, e assim sucessivamente, até chegar ao quadrado número 64. Mas aí, o que acontece? Você acabou de dar em garantia toda a sua colheita futura, para sempre. Now, when Marx was writing, much of the world was open, so this compounding growth could easily be absorbed. But... Now we are in a situation where we're no longer in the early stages, we're like close to the 32nd square where everything is now involved in capital accumulation. In other words, endless growth has become a real serious problem. A real serious problem because there is no room for that endless growth, but also because of the environmental consequences of that endless growth. This then connects to what is going on in urbanization. Build its cities. One of the classic examples of this was Paris after 1848. In 1848, there was a crisis of growth in capitalism. And a crisis typically is a situation in which surplus labor and surplus capital are side by side, but there seems to be no way to put the two back to work together again. The crisis of 1848 produced a revolution, a working class revolution, which was eventually crushed by bourgeois action. But the bourgeoisie could not find a way to put capital and labor back to work. It was still in an economic crisis. And then along came the nephew of uh, Bonaparte, uh, who said, well, make me an emperor and I will solve the problem for you. Make me a dictator and I will do what has to be done to get the economy running again. Now, he knew he would not last very long as emperor unless he put capital and labor back to work. And the way one of the key ways in which he did it was to rebuild Paris. And he brought this guy, Haussmann, to Paris to rebuild the city. And if you go to Paris today, you'll see much of that city that was rebuilt during this period as a way of getting out of the crisis of 1847-48. But of course, what was interesting about the rebuilding of Paris was that it meant expelling the working class and the working people from the center of the city. You build all the new boulevards for the bourgeoisie, you expel the people. The people are expelled to the periphery. In other words, all of the elements that you've told me about tonight were there in Second Empire Paris as part of the strategy of capital accumulation, actually seizing hold of the city as a means to resolve its problems of growth. The same thing happened in the United States after 1945. The big depression of the 1930s was partially solved during the Second World War by putting capital and labor back to work on the war effort. But then the question arose, what would happen after the war? How would the United States guarantee that it not fall back into depression? And the answer after 1945 was suburbanization. That is, you created the suburbs. And not only did you create the suburbs, you also built new cities in the American South and the American West. Cities like Dallas and Los Angeles were small places in 1945. But by the time you get to 1960, they are large places, metropolitan areas, suburbanization, highways all over the place. It was a suburbanization project of the whole nation, which actually brought labor and capital together in this vast expansion during the 1950s and 1960s. But the development of the cities through this mechanism 
uh, involved a great deal of displacement and disruption and generated a great deal of discontent, particularly on the most impoverished parts of the population and racial minorities. So capital was doing extremely well during the 1950s and 1960s, but a large segment of the population were not doing well at all. So during the 1960s, there were a whole series of urban rebellions in the United States. Los Angeles, New York, Detroit, different places, different years. But on the occasion of the assassination of Martin Luther King, about 120 cities experienced uprisings against the displacements that had been going on. These urban uprisings ended the whole kind of strategy of stabilizing America's growth through suburbanization and regional development. Now, this early phase that I'm talking about of 1945 was one which was really guided by emphasizing the demand side of the economy. It actually corresponded to the kind of economics which Marx describes in volume two of Capital, where Marx argues that you cannot depress wages of the workers and the working class too much, because if you do, you will not have a market. Therefore, it is in the interest of capital to support, to some degree, make more power on the part of the workers. So the working class from 1945 onwards was empowered to some degree, not only in North America, but also in Europe, with strong political parties and with strong union organization and with strong uh, sort of working class mobilization. Unfortunately, this only applied to the white working class, which meant that the white working class suburbanized, the black population was essentially left in the cities, and that was where the uprisings came from. But all of this came to an end in the crisis of the 1970s, where clearly you couldn't continue that solution to capital's problems. So there was a radical shift in economic thinking away from demand-side analysis to supply-side analysis, which in effect said, we go from the scenario that Marx describes in volume one, uh, in volume two, sorry, and we move back to the scenario that he described in volume one. In volume one, Marx talks about production of the surplus value, and if you want to maximize that, you have to crush the power of labor, keep wages as low as possible, keep working conditions as bad as you can possibly make them, and disempower labor. So we've had 40 years of attack throughout much of the capitalist world, attack against the power of labor in order to favor the production of value and surplus value by capital. In order to be able to crush labor, you needed to make capital very mobile. And the form of capital that is very mobile is money form. Money is like butterfly. It can fly around and land here and then go somewhere else. Commodities move around the world much more slowly, but production even uh, is harder to move. So part of the strategy that the capitalists took in trying to discipline labor was to liberate finance capital so it could go to wherever the wages were lowest. As a result of that, finance capital deindustrialized much of the United States and much of Europe and most of the traditional centers of working class organization. Financialization didn't occur by accident. It was a, st a strategy to disempower labor. But in disempowering labor, it also disempowered national governments who lost more and more control over capital flow. All of the data from most of the, con the countries that are central to the capitalist enterprises show that the share of labor in national income has been declining steadily since the 1970s. All of the data show that since the 1970s, the rich have become much richer and the poor have become relatively poorer which is exactly what Marx would predict on the basis of the one volume one analysis.
But then this would say, well, what do we say about the volume two problem? What happens with the market when workers have less purchasing power? Well, one of the things you can do is to give the workers credit. And then they can use their credit cards to deal with the fact that there's a lot of consumer goods out there that will not be consumed unless they have access to them. Now, this creates a very interesting situation. And I think it puts us in a, in a sense to try to understand where we are right now. It's against that background that we see that capital is spending much, much more of its assets and its resources on urban development. For instance, what happened in the United States after about the year 2000 is that more and more money went into the housing market and more and more people were drawn into uh, the housing market as a way of supplementing their income. Capital assisted this by uh, creating these new debt instruments and strange sounding things like collateralized debt obligations, things of this sort. So sophisticated financial instruments that were supposed to help us uh, invest more wisely. Capitalist growth from the 1990s onwards was increasingly dependent upon a very rapid process of urbanization. That is, more and more capital was flowing into urban forms of development. And this is very different from what existed in the 19th century, when capital would move from, say, Britain to the United States to build uh, a new economy. This was capital moving around the world, moving into cities and rebuilding cities on a global basis. In other words, planetary urbanization became one of capital's central strategies of development. And we're now locked into that as a major strategy, and it's very difficult to see how capital can get out of it. For instance, I've argued that the United States' growth during the period after 2000 to 2008 was entirely driven by consumerism, which was connected to the speculative activities in the housing market. When that all crashed in 2008, this actually posed some very, very serious problems. Problems in the financial system, but also problems in consumption because there was no longer the consumption there and the argument Marx makes in volume two became very prophetic at this point because without sufficient consumption, then the, all of those producers who were connected to the American consumer market had a very difficult time. In fact, the collapse of consumption inside of the United States created a huge problem for the export industries of China. And there were estimates that at the beginning of 2009, China had lost 30 million jobs in the export sector. But a survey at the end of the year of net job losses in China suggested that China had lost only 3 million jobs, which means that somehow or other in 2009, they actually created 27 million jobs. How did they do that? They did the same as Haussmann had done in Paris back in the 1850s, and as Robert Moses did in the United States in 1945. They went into a frantic phase of city building not only city building, but city building as part of a national rebalancing of the economy by building cities in the interior of China to balance the cities which were vigorously growing in the coastal regions. But the Chinese effort was a huge effort on a scale which is absolutely unthinkable. They built whole new cities in inner China which had nobody living in them. They built infrastructures and, of course, they liberated the purchase of housing through financial aid to people who wanted to buy. In other words, they constructed a speculative boom in the housing market. The housing 
Prices in Shanghai were doubling every two years. And while that has slowed down, it is still a very rapid rate of expansion. China was the only country to really manage very, very strong growth uh, in the immediate wake of the crash of 2008. But that growth actually spilled over to all of those countries that were, all those economies that were providing raw materials to the China urbanization project. That is, Chile did very well because it was sending the copper. Australia did very well, it was providing raw materials. Much of Latin America became heavily involved in the China trade, providing soybeans to China. When you combine that with some of your own urbanization strategies here in Brazil, for instance, Lula in the immediate response to the crisis of 2007, 2008, said we will build a million new houses Again, this is a getting out of the crisis by building houses and the like. And also, of course, uh, increasing internal demand by the Bolsa Familia pro program. This meant that Brazil felt the crisis rather in a rather shallow kind of way. In fact, uh, this, during this period, there was strong growth through the Andean countries like Ecuador, Bolivia. So the urbanization project in China was a huge boost to the global economy. China has consumed half of the world's cement output since 2008, half of the world's steel supplies, a large proportion of the world's copper resources. So there is, in effect, a continuation of the property boom in China uh, that crashed in the United States. So we're seeing a repeat of what happened in the United States, but this time in China. And the big question is, what happens when the China boom crashes? But capital is not only engaged in city building in China. It's also rebuilding and remaking the cities of the Western world. All of the major cities that I've visited have property booms in place. All of those property booms are about building a certain kind of city, the kind of city that capital wants. Capital has no interest in building cities for people. It only has an interest in building cities for profit. So what are the profitable activities that the capitalists can engage in? Capitalists love uh, mega projects. They hate to be bothered with neighborhood activities. So they like the mega projects of building new stadiums, building new parts of the city. Uh, they love projects which have a high rate of return, which means building the kind of city that the rich people want to live in. So capital actually builds high-value housing uh, for a limited market. In fact, a lot of ca what capital builds is not actually lived in. It's a very interesting thing in New York City to go around and look at all of the buildings at night and see how many of these new buildings have the lights on. And the answer is a lot of them are empty because people bought the apartments as a speculation, not as a place to live. And when you say, who are these people? Well, it's Russian oligarchs or it's Saudi princes or it's people with vast amounts of money from... Latin America who want a place in Miami or New York. The same is true in London. London is essentially priced out of the market in terms of available housing for the mass of the population. There's a tremendous shortage of affordable and decent housing for the mass of the people and an overproduction of speculative properties for the ultra-rich. There was a scandal recently about one road, long road in London with many mansions on it. And when somebody inquired if anybody was living in any of them, it turned out they were all empty. Now, I've encountered the same story in almost every major city that I've been to. That capital builds speculative property for the upper classes but, and mega projects. It loves to build mega projects on the principle of public-private partnerships in which the general rule is that the public takes all of the risk and the private takes all of the profits. And the result is that the cities are being used again and again and again
in the purpose of this endless capital accumulation. Because there's tremendous pressure on capital to find places to put its money and find places to construct profitable investment opportunities in the face of this sudden shift in the compound rate of growth. Now when I look at this story and I've connected it back and said you could see the same processes that you are now experiencing here in Fortaleza, in Paris in 1850, in London in 1870, in the United States in 1945. You can see it in almost every city of the world right now, in which capital has to make and remake cities in its own image because it has nothing else better to do. But it creates an insane form of urbanization in which the mass of the people have nowhere to live just simply so that capital can reproduce. Now, what this leads to, I think, is the following conclusion, that we can continue to fight all of the struggles we have to fight to try to preserve neighborhoods, to pry, try to prevent evictions and dislocations. We can do it in a better way than we do now by combining together many different struggles of homeless people, anti-gentrification movements, affordable housing movements and the like. But what Marx teaches is at some point or other we have to go to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is capitalism. We have to find some way to transform many of the movements we are working with into an anti-capitalist movement. And we have to ask some questions as to what that anti-capitalist movement would try to do. One of the issues that Marx raises in volume one, page one of Capital, is the distinction between use values and exchange values. What conventional economics teaches is that the best way and the most efficient way to get use values to people is to liberate the market process so that the exchange value system can freely function. I'm old enough to remember in the 1950s being promised that global poverty would be eliminated by liberating the market. I heard the same story in the 1960s and in the 1970s. And it took me until about the 1980s when I'm nearly 60 years old to realize this is a total lie. That actually the market system produces poverty. The market system produces inequality. The market system deprives many people of access to needed use values. The market system cannot, cannot provide affordable housing for the mass of the population. All the market system can do is to produce surplus condominiums for the very rich. The market system cannot produce, and capital in the market system cannot produce a decent house in a decent living environment for the mass of the population. Capital and the market system actually deprives people of access to use values. It does not actually help. Increasingly, we that were not in the market 30 or 40 years ago are now commodified and put into the market. What kind of society would you prefer to live in? One which delivered the use value of decent housing, free education, free health care, to everybody in the population on an egalitarian basis. Would you rather live in that kind of society or one which rations access to healthcare, education, housing uh, and the like through the market system? What Marx suggested is that we should limit our reliance upon the market system and capital accumulation and emphasize the provision of use values. Now, over the last 20 years or so, what we've seen are more and more social movements emerging in cities. Sometimes these movements come with violent and, and disruptive protests. And what this means is that there's a great reserve of discontent with the qualities of urban life. Urban life is no longer uh, something that can be anticipated with pleasure relaxation. What we're seeing, uh, as it happened in Brazil last year, happened in Turkey, happened in London, happened in all of these things, as I mentioned earlier, what we see is a broad discontent with the qualities of urban life. 
And a lot of this involves new ways of doing politics and new forms of making political demands. The conventional political parties that functioned in the past do not function very well. They don't know how to answer the question of how to provide a decent life and a decent living environment to the mass of the population. And of course, in many instances, politics is actually uh, controlled by big money power. In the United States, we have the best political system that money can buy. And I think that uh, this, of course, means also corruptions of the media, uh, legalized corruption. Supreme Court fun uh, agrees to the, expenditure, the unlimited expenditure of personal money on electoral campaigns. So one of the things we see is the emergence of even greater inequality since 2008 than existed before 2008. In other words, after 2008, capital and the top 1% have done very well. And the people have done very badly. And the only way in which that can be changed is by having a mass movement amongst the people. And one of the demands of that mass movement of the people has to be to pay careful attention to the qualities of urban life for everybody in the population. To make real this constitutional engagement that says people have a right to be consulted. Because a lot of these movements that have occurred in the last 15, 20 years have been about lack of democracy. A democracy that is given over to the quest for greater levels of social justice. Capital cannot concede that because capital is locked in to this business of only making cities of the sort that it wants. And if capital cannot address the real needs of the people, then capital should go. And we have to find alternative ways of structuring economic life. Okay. Some of which already exist around us and can be found in the organizational forms that exist in the cities. This is a very critical historical moment when urbanization and what's going on in the cities becomes a key political question. Okay. Unfortunately, we are not the only ones to realize and recognize that. Because what capital class power is doing right now is trying to create a form of the state apparatus which is effectively going to militarize urban life. And what we're seeing is actually the emergence of repressive apparatuses in cities which are actually criminalizing protest, criminalizing those people who are searching for an alternative basis for urban life. This is where a lot of the struggle lies right now. And I think that there are signs that this struggle is growing and becoming more and more significant. And it's also becoming global, and it's also becoming more explicitly anti-capital. I think what's going on right now is essentially insane. And I think that the only sane way out is to try to become more and more concerned to construct an anti-capitalist movement. Part of that movement will be around demanding the right to the city and the right to social justice in the city. Part of that will be about maximizing the delivery of use values and minimizing the exchange value power. And part of it will also be about the search for democratic forms of representation and decision making. In other words, it's going to involve the construction of some sort of alternative political program which moves us steadily away from the capitalist track onto something radically different. And I think collectively we can do this uh, if we pay attention both to the forms of the movement and also to the theoretical background. And with that, I thank my translator. Gostaria She's been fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm generally uh, accused of being too dialectical, so it's interesting to uh, be told I'm not. Um, the contradictions, of course, uh, are 
derived largely from a reading of Marx. Uh, the first one is between use value and exchange value and the way in which uh, the commodity contains, uh, as it were, these two dimensions, use value and exchange value, and one tends to exclude uh, the other. Uh, there are 17 such contradictions. One I've talked about tonight, which is between production and realization, which is the contradiction between volume one and volume two of Capital. So the Contradictions book is about all of those contradictions and how to understand them and what kind of politics comes out. But uh, that book is not yet in Portuguese. It will be out, I think, sometime next year. So maybe I'll come back and talk about it uh, next year. A couple of... Uh, uh, the other... There were, in a way, two other themes in the other questions. The first theme is how, how do we operate in relationship to existing institutions of state power and existing institutions of finance? Uh, the answer is that uh, in the existing circumstances we are in, we have to think about ways uh, to collaborate and, if necessary, to co-opt some of those institutions. It's there have been situations in which uh, a local state apparatus uh, will work in collaboration and cooperation and partnership with the social movements. Unfortunately, that has become increasingly rare in many of the societies I've met, but it is not impossible. Uh, the state is a large rambling set of different institutions, some of which uh, can be negotiated with and some of which cannot. Uh, in the light of what I pointed out, which is the militarization of the state management of urban affairs, I think that it's vital that popular movements control the state apparatus in order to control that militarization. Uh, the, the same issue arises with, with reference to the banks. There are different forms of uh, banking. There are the vast investment banks. Now, I don't know how it is here in Brazil, but in the United States we have uh, credit unions, which are neighborhood credit structures. There's been a long history of working class construction of mutual aid financial institutions, which have helped uh, working people deal with uh, emergencies or deal with uh, crises by extending credit. I'm in fact in favor of the socialization of financial institutions. And at the same time, I'm also in favor of exploring alternative notions of property. Uh, there are alternative ways of assuring people's access to housing than through private property and home ownership. Uh, even in the United States, we have collective forms of property which I think uh, uh, produce things like uh, what, what's called a community land trust, where the land cannot be traded and therefore you cannot speculate on it. Really? And I imagine a situation in which there is a neighborhood credit union and a community land trust. Uh, the, these institutions already exist and I think we should be using them creatively to explore alternatives. And I think we should be thinking about the urban as a commons, so that common property regimes become more, more easily established, in which new institutions of management of the urban commons come into being uh, outside of the state. So it's not a, simply a choice between state and market and between state and private property, but the creation of alternative institutional arrangements to ensure people's access to use values. Now within this there is also uh, the question which was posed in one of the, one of the comments, uh, 
about exclusion. I think we have to recognize that some forms of exclusion are always going to be involved. For instance, I would like to exclude the ultra-rich from decision-making over the city. Uh, it's interesting when you say something like that, people say, oh, but you're anti-democratic. And the very rich suddenly decide they're Democrats when they've spent most of their lives totally excluding anybody else from any, help, any action within uh, the city. Now, there's always going to be a struggle over who will be included and who will be excluded. There is right now a politics of dispossession operating within the city. I'm not opposed to dispossession of the ultra-rich. What seems to me is the problem is that the ultra-rich are dispossessing us. And therefore, anti-dispossession movements on the part of those being dispossessed become a crucial way of ensuring the dispossession of those who are doing the dispossessing, if you understand it. <laughs> so we should not be fearful of all exclusions. Okay, I think that answers that question.